All right, let's talk about projects. So uh, if you guys are still stuck after today, after I've shown you some of these things, I have, I have many more examples. This, this is just a list that I asked some of our fellow ESRM faculty, hey, uh, what projects do you have going on or are you, are you, would you love to pursue but you just don't have enough time? Uh, and and, uh, and you know, how many students might you need on that? So this is not a prescriptive, this is not saying that you need to do X, Y, and Z. This is basically a, a topic, broad or narrow, that a faculty member would, uh, could use some help with and or has some data that you could analyze and you could take it and run with it and do stuff like that. So since I've generated this list, some of you guys might have talked to some of these professors and you know, got some stuff going on and that's totally cool. I'm not trying to you know, suck up your project. And most, if not all of our cases, uh, these projects can uh, you know, use several folks. So I'm just gonna run through these. Uh, and you guys stop me or ask questions. And I flagged uh, the main folks that would be people that you could talk to first. Maybe they're the people you, you could work with as your mentor. Maybe they're a person that would direct you to another faculty member or another outside person. But, but these are all contact people or almost all contact people right here um, so I can get you guys going in the next uh, day or next week or so. Cool? So I'm gonna go through these and again, interrupt me if you guys have any questions. So these are in no particular order, just the order I started writing them down. Um, oh, oh for, first, first let me say, again, previous students. So previous students' projects, as we mentioned last time, totally cool, totally cool place. Take what, what, what she did last year, build on it. Take what he proposed three years ago, enact the, the proposal, right? That's all totally good, that, that, that's, all, that, that's great. So all of the previous capstones are potentially fodder for you. And um, almost every project, at least for the last several years, one of the things you guys are gonna do at the end of this class is you are going to give me obviously your poster, obviously your thesis, but also you're gonna submit your GIS data files, you're gonna submit your Excel you know, field data, percent cover, whatever it is, so we have all those. And so if you want to build off a previous student's work, you can take that and, and go forward with it. So that's by design so that you guys can build off the shoulder, you can stand on the shoulders of your, of your predecessors. And that's not a bad thing. Okay, uh, projects. So marine debris. So this is a project that uh, is externally funded through NOAA. And this is a project looking at the deposited materials uh, in different areas of our, of our county and Santa Barbara County. So this is looking at marine debris. In particular, one of the things that one of our students from last year, Michaela, found is that um, compared to some historic data, we're seeing um, more and or different kinds of debris landing in our coastal zone. In particular, more fishing gear. We're seeing more derelict fishing gear. We're seeing a greater proportion of, of debris that's plastic showing up on our beaches. And so this is a project that um, uh, is to do essentially quarterly inventories on the islands and or monthly inventories here on some beaches on the mainland. So if you guys are interested in debris and debris management, um, you know, fisheries, that kind of stuff, uh, a, good, a great project for you guys. So I would direct you guys to either Claire or Cause if that's, that project is of interest to you. Also, I should say, you know, these are, most of these are ongoing projects that, that are, uh, you know, going on. So if you guys have interest in the, these topics in general, you guys are more than welcome to go talk to one of these professors, even if you're not going to do it for your capstone. I just think at the phase you guys are, you guys don't have time to do independent studies so much. So, but, but do realize that you could, you could talk to these folks about this. Uh, next is our, our ongoing um, stuff about microplastics. So, um, Alex and Maggie, you, you, you guys I think are both interested in doing this. Alex, more of the organism side. Maggie, right? Sediment or no? What are you thinking? Uh, yeah, Don't know yet. Uh, okay. Uh, doing more like population water secondary. Okay. Species, but at the okay, cool. So, so uh, microplastics in the sediment, in the abiotic environment, microplastics in the aqueous environment, right? Floating in the water column or in the river microplastics ingested in organisms. All of those are huge topics. These guys are working on it, but there's way more work than any two people can do. 
So if that's of interest, I would direct you guys to um, uh, Claire or myself, but, but Claire is the just starter one. Um, great. Uh, sh uh, next is um, Dr. Patch Kiki uh, did her PhD on sand budgets up and down the coast. And one of the things she did was look at armoring up and down the coast, but that's a bit old. So she's interested in, in, re in, in updating, I should say, that data set. Uh, a great example, so for example, the products we just talked about, field and laboratory based, right? This one, the GIS is primarily a, uh, a GIS based thing, right? Looking at photographs, occasionally going out in the field. So we have a whole range of, of uh, projects. So one of the things you might want to at least give qualitative thought to is, um, you know, your availability. So if you guys have really just you have really tough work schedules and you're just gonna be really hard to get out in the field maybe a project that's more gis based which is going to give you more more time flexibility to to you know work around your other schedule maybe that's going to be a, a better fit for you so okay but anyway so this is doing um updating the database of how much of our coastline in california is armored with with concrete with boulders with whatever the the case may be and talk to Dr. Patch if that's of interest. Um, then I misspelled, that's a great spelling job there. Um, but uh, this is um, doing some digitizing of San Miguel and Santa Rosa, some of our channel islands, um, specifically to look at uh, erosional change. So to look at uh, beach accretion, uh, beach loss, stuff like that. So if that's in, of interest, again, a, a, a computer-based uh, geospatial type project, see Kiki. Um, Another one is using uh, same kind of idea, but instead of using aerial photos over different times, using um, uh, you know landscape photos, so from the ground. Um, we've had some students do some great projects uh, of using this over the years, so that's a great one. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Patch is uh, interested in finding someone who that's that's interested in doing um, geomorphology, so the shape of the beaches measuring the shape of beaches. Um, and uh, that, that can either be with uh, standard rod that you guys might have done in water resources or stuff like that, or with our new drone technology that we're um, coming out with uh, using laser beams and, and uh, flying robots. So if that's, if that's of interest, uh, see her. And in that particular project, that she's specifically, they're trying to see if they can replicate um, some methods from the East Coast here and see if they can uh, train uh, school children and other people to be engaged with that. So if that's of interest, talk to Kiki. Um, we have an ongoing project just looking at the at beach nourishment. So this is our, uh, we had, it started two years ago. Another student picked it up last year, so continued on the capstone project. And if you guys are interested in continuing that, that would be great to do that again. That, that particular nourishment is uh, near uh, Port Wainimi. But uh, we also have some nourishment going on in the Ventura uh, Harbor. And then also Broad Beach is just um, getting ready to be nourished. Broad Beach, the, the beach in Malibu that has been robbed of sand in recent years. So if any of those things are of interest, if, you, if you're interested in nourishment and what that might do to the shape of the beach, coastal resources, et cetera, see Dr. Patch. Uh, any questions about those so far? I'm going kind of fast. Does that make sense? Am I going too fast? No? Okay. All right. Uh, number next would be uh, Sandy Beach Infauna. Again, a project that uh, we've had students working on for each of the last few years, uh, monitoring beaches uh, throughout the year so we can look at the, the change in critters. Great project if you guys are interested in climate change. Great project if you guys are interested in human impacts. Um, we have seen a, a radical change just in the couple years we've been, a couple years or three years, four years, we've been looking at this. And um, it'd be really great to have someone continue this on. And this is basically doing in faunal surveys, in faunal transects on our sandy beach. So it does not require a lot of equipment. We have everything. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's been a, a great project if you guys are interested in that. Uh, then we have some students. Uh, if, you, if you guys are interested in our roadkill data set, that has about 5,000 dead things in it and about 50,000 miles of transects across Ventura County. A lot of you guys have participated in this through Cons Bio, Cons Bio Lab. 
Um, the data set is much more extensive than that, but um, if you guys are interested in doing analyses, that would be great. We, this is one of those things where I keep saying every year, oh, I should write this up and we should do a write-up on it. And then I get distracted by a million different crises and it doesn't get, so we have now about 11 years of data. So really neat, you can look at the effect of the Springs fire, we can look at the effect of climate change, the effect of drought, and the data set is long enough now that I think we can have, um, ask some really neat questions. So this would be a great project for you guys, maybe the first bit you would just sort of clean up the data set and get it all cool and do some initial, ex initial monitoring, and then maybe, or initial ex exploration, and then maybe with, you might test a few hypotheses using that data set, maybe some additional surveys you might do in winter time or something great project if you guys are interested in ecological fragmentation stuff like that same goes for our seafood sustainability project that that's been that's coastal right so some of you guys are in coastal this semester some of you guys have been in it before but same thing was we add about 5,000 items to the database every year and we do some analysis in coastal but it, we don't have a lot of time so it's very very uh, basic so um uh yeah so are you thinking about still doing it. So, so Jasmine has been doing some interesting stuff with Spanish speaking versus English speaking uh, 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 communities when we, we asked them about the stuff. So uh, really cool. Uh, maybe you could collaborate with her. Maybe you could do something different. The data set is so large. It's um, again, another project where there's way more work than one person could possibly look at, but, but um, a good opportunity to use some of the data that your, your fellow students have collected over the years. Um, next is, and those are all me, I guess. Yeah, sorry, my names appear too frequently, but um, sorry. Um, uh, next is our Dudley project. So that's a project funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service to recover this endangered plant that is only now known from four locations here in the Santa Monica's. The entirety of the species burnt, the entire of the species range burnt in the Springs Fire in 2013. We went from about 50,000, an estimated about 50,000 individuals to about, uh, well, 200 individuals and of, of distinct genetic lineages, you know, maybe less than 50. And, and the drought has come on right after that fire. And so we may well be witnessing the extinction of this species in the wild. So we're doing some stuff and I need someone that is interested in learning 3D printing to make some fake, fake plants that we're gonna plant out there and coat them with foam and do some crazy weird, uh, weird 21st century science, see if we can get these plants to grow. So if you guys are interested in, in recovering endangered species, but also trying some new technologies, um, see me. Another project that we've had students do for a couple years, we did not have anyone do it last year. And the year before, it was maybe not the strongest, uh, strongest uh, works that some students did, but we have you know, previous data from a previous couple years. Um, and so this would be using camera traps and or uh, animal um, uh, uh, track observation. Um, it could be in several spots, but especially right here in Cam Park, uh, right here on campus, because we have a long data set there. And then also um, that's related to this one, which is also, we have a citizen science group. So if you guys are interested in wildlife, we have a group that teaches you how to track wildlife of all kinds. <coughs> and we do quarterly monitoring around the county. So uh, a great project if you guys are thinking about doing more ranger type stuff, large animal management, wonderful project. You guys can get certified as a wildlife tracker in the course of doing this, and that could be great. Uh, owl diet analysis, another project that we have several years worth of data that's sort of paused because the Springs Fire came in right after we put in four. So this is a project about um, secondary, uh, second generation anticoagulant poisons. So the project was to see if we could augment the barn owl population on campus. And by augment, augmenting the barn owl population, um, uh, re reduce the need to put rat po to put rodenticide poison out. And it's a great project. We have a lot of data before we, put, we, we, we did anything different. We put in four owl nesting boxes, one of which has a web camera in it in the, in the South Quad. All great, awesome, and then uh, about four weeks after we got the boxes, the Springs Fire came through, burned through campus, and killed most of the owls, or at least drove them away. So it's probably time to re restart that survey, see how many uh, uh, kites and other birds have come in, but a really cool project looking at historic data. We have tons of historic owl pellets, too, to analyze, 
but really um, pretty cool if you guys are interested in doing diet analysis. Um, Sandy Beach Health Index, I have my name here, but this should be, I'm trying to hand this over to Kiki. Um, so this is using some of the data we've collected. Some of you guys have helped us with this the last few years. Um, Dr. Patch is working on a project that is trying to come up with a, a way to, to aggregate all this data together into a single measure for how healthy our beaches are. So if you guys are interested in that, creating, creating uh, indices of, of communities, you can talk to her about that. Already talked about that one. Already talked about that one. Um, related to the, uh, the roadkill stuff is wildlife crossing monitorings. We've had some students monitor crossings in the past. Great start, we need a lot more data. So if you guys are interested in looking at how um, large and small things go across fragmented landscapes, that's a great one. Uh, we have, uh, have a, a professor from up at Cal State uh, East Bay um, who does a lot of cool sustainability stuff, wants to partner with us to work on ROVs and how ROVs might assist with making offshore um, mariculture production more sustainable by helping to monitor water quality and stuff like that. So we're still formulating what that project is, but if, if those things are vaguely interesting, that might be a great project. Um, we have a brand new ROV coming in in uh, November that should really help with this. Uh, similarly related to that, if, uh, we need to do reactivate our, our surveys inside and outside of marine protected areas, but we'd probably wait for that November RO, new fancy ROV to show up. But if that's of interest, let me know. Or Dr. Patch. Professor? Yeah. Oh, thanks. I skipped the oil spill. Okay, great. So um, also we've been doing various things with oil spills. If you guys are interested in oil spill toxicology, let me know. We have both raw crude samples. We have tarball samples. We have uh, contaminated sediment, contaminated soils. The soils come from uh, uh, the most recent Hall Canyon uh, oil spill this in uh, end of June this year. So if you guys are interested in that, looking at how we might get oils to break down quicker, um, how critters respond, either, either the, the degradation of oil itself or how, how organisms respond to that toxin. Um, there's myself, there's, there's several, there's myself, there's me, man, I'm speaking really well. I'm speaking, I don't speak good of her. Um, there, there's me, but also we have some external partners as well. And I have, and I have uh, external money to do some of those studies too, if you guys are interested. We have some, some uh, resources to do some testing and things like that. So if you guys are interested in uh, oil spill toxicity, let me know. Uh, sand dollar beds, we had a great start of a project uh, that uh, uh, got off the ground, but it was a little bit slow. So we'd love for somebody to revisit that, but looking at the sand dollar communities across Southern California, that could be um, more of a literature review and, and sort of uh, talking to experts around the state, or it could be on scuba or snorkeling. Um, so let me know. Um, yeah. So uh, if you're doing scuba, yes, you would need American Academy of Underwater Science Research Certification. Remind me about that. I, I want to talk about that in a second. But, um, but uh, just free diving, most of these guys are between 15 and 20 feet. So just this last weekend, I found a, 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 not a new bed, but a new bed for me down in, um, in Orange County. And so that's, that's just snorkeling, right? You can do most of that just snorkeling. It's really shallow. So you, need, you don't necessarily have to have AUS for that. That would be really helpful, but you don't need it. Uh, next is, uh, there's a whole host of things that are coming up now with the Coastal Commission and some of our other land management, coastal management agencies. Um, a lot of stuff from conversations with various folks, and I, and this, I have my name here, but this would really be with different agency people, uh, but you can talk to me first. Uh, we've, done, we've spent a huge amount of money over the last 30 years buying land in the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, doing these various things, and we don't really have a great study of that. So how much money did we spend? How effective was that? Did, was that um, acquiring land that was, that was um, you know, available to our underserved communities? Was that mostly in high-end <coughs> affluent communities? You know, that kind of stuff. Great project um, uh, and, and just so much to do on that. So if you guys, if that's a, of interest, that would be one that's more of a, you know, kind of research book, literature type stuff, but really could be a really cool project, especially if you guys are interested in planning and stuff like that. 
Uh, Brett is um, interested in continuing his remote sensing of vegetation across the islands, looking at vegetation change using satellite data, primarily, um, what does he use? Um, Landsat. Landsat, thank you, yeah, 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 Landsat data. Um, That's a sick project, by the way, my friend did. Really yeah, that's a good project. Um, stream geomorphology, Dr. O'Hyrick is always doing stuff down in the channels and always looking for students. So if you guys are interested in looking at how streams evolve or, or how they change over time, great one. She's also, uh, I didn't list it, but uh, she also was interested in um, maybe looking at some erosional studies. We've had some recent burns in Thousand Oaks and some other places in the last couple months. I think she's interested in a student possibly doing measurements of erosion. So that's great there. Uh, cause is, uh, again, uh, we have this uh, project that's funded by NOAA where we mostly work with uh, middle school kids and high school kids, but he's, he's in need of some more uh, assistance with that. So that's great um, if you guys are, are so interested. Um, is Dulce in this class? No, she's in the other section. But so, so she's working on that, but we can use other folks. Um, and then Dr. Rodriguez, so we have one shorebird uh, project already going on in here, but again, there's, there's tons of other stuff. If you guys are interested, we could, uh, Dr. Rodriguez could use additional um, assistance. So if, if birds are your thing, Dr. Rodriguez is your prof. So um, he'd love to, uh, love to get some help with that. And again, there's tons of others. These are just a few that uh, some, of, some of our fellow faculty suggested that might be good projects. So with that, I'll be quiet. And you guys, uh, you guys have any questions? Are you guys wondering about anything about that? Andy? Right, could you just explain the marine debris real quick again? Yeah. Can I explain the marine debris? Can I show you the marine debris? Let's see if I can show you the marine. OK, so I, I don't want to get into posters and start talking about stuff. But just to give you the, quick, the rough idea, the idea of this project is monitoring um, stuff on the mainland and then monitoring stuff out on the islands. One thing we're seeing, which is interesting, is we're seeing a, a, a distinct uh, signal of stuff on the islands versus stuff on the mainland. That's big stuff, macroscopic debris, as well as small stuff, micro debris, um, microplastics and other stuff. Um, so uh, generally, we see more ocean derived or, or um, more, more immediately coming from the ocean waste arriving on the islands, more immediately deriving from land-based sources on our mainland beaches. So what would that mean? That would mean more things like tennis shoes, um, uh, kids' toys, things of that nature on our mainland beaches, whereas our stuff out on the islands would be more things like fishing gear, more like uh, uh, floating logs, stuff, stuff of that. I mean, log wouldn't be debris, but you guys get what I'm saying. Um, interestingly, we see the same thing with micro debris, with micro debris, with microplastics, let's say, we see pellet, um, a greater proportion of the material is pelletized stuff, is essentially either a pellet that, that fell off a ship or a plastic cup that started off as a big honking plastic cup and then the sun and the waves broke into a smaller piece and a smaller piece and a smaller piece and a smaller piece. That is more common on our islands in the Channel Islands and in all the beaches we've sampled in Hawaii and in the beaches we've sampled in the Cook Islands and other places. On the mainland, we see a greater proportion of microfibers. So, what the hell am I wearing? I don't even know what I'm wearing. I should know that. But I think this is probably some kind of microfiber stuff. Um, but, you know, whatever your underwear, your hats, whatever they are, if they're microfiber and you guys, if they're, if they're synthetic and you put it in your washing machine, those fibers are oftentimes so small they don't get filtered out by the traditional physical filtering mechanism. And so when we discharge that waste, that, that, that sewage treatment effluent, it's got microfibers in it. So that we were thinking that's why our mainland is relatively enriched with microfibers. This particular project is focused on large debris, large uh, you know, um, fishing gear and plastic rope and tennis shoes, stuff like that. But it also includes a component 
using remotely operated vehicles to see if we can monitor this remotely and micro debris to see how well the, the micro and the macro debris correlate or don't. So that again is involving doing quarterly surveys out on the islands and well a quarterly or maybe three times a year. Some of the beaches because of marine mammals we might not be able to get to in certain times of the year just because of permitting. But, uh, but as much as possible quarterly surveys on the hard to get to beaches which are on the island and um, probably monthly surveys on our beaches on the mainland. And, uh, and so that I'll be comparing this data to the data we collected last year and to data that was collected in the late 80s, early 90s. So that's that project. Does that make that help you, Andy? Cool. Other questions? Other, other, uh, we've done in the past is we've done various, uh, in this case, these are small rodent traps, string lines of traps to see what rodents we have in the area. So they're baited, put out, it opened up, you know, say just before sunset and then go checked in the morning so the critter, the mice aren't, uh, nobody's killed in any of these studies. These are all, if they're trapped, they're live trapped, measured and let go. Um, most of them are camera traps or, or evidence that an animal is walking by. And so we have small mammal traps. We have um, a camera traps, which are infrared cameras that are triggered by movement. And so uh, when, when, when a hiker or a horse or somebody walks in front, it takes a picture. And then the, uh, the uh, yellow are sand traps, where you take either sand or just the regular uh, dirt in the area, si uh, sort of cl cleared of rocks and stuff, sieve it and make it nice and sort of like, a, like powdered sugar. And we can see really clearly where the critters have walked through. And so but all those methods are ways of standardizing um, the time or the area that critters have gone through. So we can count, are there twice as many guys over here as over here, what have you. And so uh, some of this was related to, to the Springs fire. It need not be about that. But the basic question is, what, firstly, just what critters do we have here right now? Do we have mountain lions here right now? Do we have bobcats here right now? What have you? You can compare that to the previous work of previous students. The other thing you can do, look, look through space. So do we have more guys down here by the river corridor? Do we have fewer guys up here? Do we have uh, you know, more pregnant moms with you know, babies kind of up here or what have you? So that type of project. Um, and uh, while, while you don't necessarily need special training to do this, um, we have, a, like I said, we have a great tracking group here in the county and they hold uh, quarterly training sessions and monthly practice sessions around the county where if you guys want, and this is available to anybody, you guys, can get, you guys don't have to be um, associated with the university, you can just be volunteering. And it's a great way to learn what a skunk tracks looks like. And once you start getting better, you can tell if the skunk was walking or if the skunk was jogging. You can tell, I mean, these guys, I mean, these guys are way better than I'll ever be, but they, they uh, can tell a, a massive amount um, from the tracks, which is where a critter leaves an imprint, and sign, which a sign would be maybe a critter scratched up a tree, pooped right here, whatever. So by able to read tracks and signs, you can tell a huge amount about the ecology of these guys, and in particular, how much wildlife connectivity we're seeing. Are critters going from this area to this area, and so this is a viable wildlife corridor, or is this getting not very much movement, and so therefore not that big a player in terms of connectivity between chunk A and chunk B. So that kind of stuff, that kind of stuff. Great project, really good project. Anybody else? <laughs> 